Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lasano. So last episode, I had Gertrude Mueller Nelson on the podcast, and that episode kind of wrapped up the series that we did that was specifically for parents. And I wanted to let y'all know that I have put a link in the show notes for a page on our website that has a list of all the episodes that we think are really beneficial for parents. So if you are looking for episodes for parents, go check out that link. So today we have Father Boniface Hicks on the podcast to speak about the power and gift of accompaniment and how this work of accompaniment parallels so beautifully with what we do in our work in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I hope you enjoy. Father Boniface, welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. Thanks, Carrie. It's great to be with you and great to be with your audience. I, I am really excited that you have joined us and that um, our, both of our schedules to work so well. I'm really grateful for you. Well, it's a real joy for me. I, I've uh, grown to love Catechesis of the Good Shepherd so much, and just anything I can do to support it and promote it is, uh, is a joy for me. Well, that's beautiful. So tell us, who are you, and how did you hear about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Uh, My name is Father Boniface Hicks. I am a Benedictine, and my home, my Arch Abbey, is uh, St. Vincent Arch Abbey in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. We're the first Benedictines in the United States and the largest Benedictine monastery in the world. We have a college and a seminary, and I'm especially involved with the seminary. And uh, also, I'm the director of the Institute for Ministry Formation, which is part of the seminary. And Catechesis of the Good Shepherd is a significant program that we are uh, offering and promoting, uh, that is to say, catechetical formation and uh, CGS formation um, through our institute, which I'd love to talk a little bit more about. But I got to know Catechesis of the Good Shepherd uh, through a colleague. I also helped to run We Are One Body uh, Catholic Radio, and one of my colleagues there, Anita Wright, was a big believer in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd and. Um, introduced me to, uh, anyway, I can, all the names get a little bit confusing and lost, but um, <laughs> introduced me to somebody who who walked me into the atrium and explained, I, I got to see children uh, working. I saw the the, uh, the presentation of the temple work being presented and got to see the children working with that and uh, with other uh, things in the atrium. And I was so struck by that experience. I can go more into that, but uh, that got me interested. And then as Anita was formed through level one, two, three, and started to uh, form Atria in Latrobe, I had the chance to learn a lot from her. She has really, really good insight and is able to explain at my level what's happening. And it just resonated with my understanding of the spiritual life. And and things have just continued to cascade. I, I can probably go on for quite a while in uh, how I've continued to learn and grow, but I just have become so struck through those experiences that I'm convinced there's no other uh, reasonable formation for children in the faith, no better reasonable formation for children in the faith, and uh, have really put a lot of resources into promoting CGS at this point. Mm, That's really great. That's really great. So um, how long ago was that first encounter? Well, um, I actually have to take it back one chapter. So the first significant encounter that I just mentioned was about 12 years ago, 13 okay. years ago. I actually was introduced to it briefly when I was a deacon 20 years ago. Mm. The parish next to ours that we were closely associated with had uh, Anna Mae Guido as a catechist. And I just got a very brief uh, introduction to it. And it just planted a seed. I knew the name. I had some exposure, but I didn't really get it at that point. It was about right. 13 years ago, the, the experience I mentioned that was really profound for me. That's neat. So God has slowly been working in your life and through this work. That's really neat. I always love to see that golden thread in people's life of how God has slowly been working, whether it's through this work or um, just on their spiritual journey. It's always really neat to see. 
So tell me more about your work with accompaniment. Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, really been a, a passion in my life. I am an adult convert. I was baptized Catholic when I was 21. And soon after that, had my first experience of spiritual direction. I entered the monastery at St. Vincent when I was 22 and had a more dedicated spiritual direction. And I saw uh, quickly the great value of it. And that became more and more of a focus uh, in my in my personal experience and then a desire when I became a priest to share that. And I was ordained in 2004 and assigned to Penn State University where I completed a doctorate in computer science, but I helped in campus ministry and started giving spiritual direction to a number of college students and just found it so fulfilling mm-hmm. and was, was really formed by my spiritual director at that time, Father Tom Acklin. And uh, over several years, became convinced that we need to form more spiritual directors. He and I wrote a book and then founded a program. And around the same time, uh, 2013, I guess, Pope Francis started really promoting accompaniment in his um, flagship document, The Joy of the Gospel. He said, everyone in the church needs to be initiated into the art of accompaniment. Mm-hmm. And as I started doing spiritual direction formation, which is, of course, is a little more highly trained, experienced, specialized, it became clear that there is a spectrum of accompaniment, if we can say on the one hand that one person walks with another person with a focus on that person's relationship with God. And then on the same spectrum is, is spiritual direction, where there's perhaps a more highly formed, experienced person and, and maybe a wider variety of settings. But that, uh, that work with accompaniment uh, has really grown. And uh, I've looked for ways to, what's the kind of minimum viable product? What's the smallest amount of formation I can give to help one person listen to and walk with and support and love another person with a focus on that person's relationship with God? And mm-hmm. So that's uh, what we've really developed over the last six uh, years, I suppose, since publishing the book and forming the program, forming some classes, and then also some workshops. And uh, so uh, accompaniment is is a posture of walking with someone in a committed way that provides space for that person, let's uh, call it the, well, the, uh, the, the person, uh, who's going to share about their relationship with God, what's going on in their hearts, uh, how they're, and and always with a kind of reference to, point towards God. And so we're, we're hearing about the mysteries, how uh, those things are striking the heart, aspects of spiritual experience, but also as that touches daily life and relationships, um, uh, various experiences of, of growth. And so that, that posture of, uh, of listening and support of unconditional love, affirmation, which is a, a relationship in which the person's relationship with God can really, can really grow. That's kind of the, the heart of it, I guess. Yeah. Is, so is accompaniment the same as spiritual direction, or is there a difference between the two? Well, again, I would say that uh, accompaniment I would provide as a, maybe a larger category uh, and maybe spiritual direction is a little bit more uh, uh, formed and focused and, and experienced and trained than uh, accompaniment. Um, but I would say, maybe I could say spiritual direction is a, a kind of specialized form of accompaniment. Right, right. Um, so, yeah. I, like as a mother, I'm hearing your description of accompaniment and thinking this sounds very much like being a mother. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and kind of just journeying with the children um, in a very specific way. But I would love to have the tools like what you teach people in accompaniment in order for me to do that in a more um, specific way that allows for spiritual growth. But it also reminds me very much of what we do in the atrium with children. Absolutely. And and uh, just to, to reinforce your uh, points there. The when we when we published the book on spiritual direction, of course, we put in the introduction. This book is for spiritual directors, but it's also for spiritual directees, and it's also for anybody who walks with anyone else in an intentional way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, parents, I think, were uh, 
at the top of the list, but a lot of helping professions have this kind of uh, gentle, uh, patient assurance that comes through a committed relationship with a posture of listening and loving support. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then to reinforce it another way, I really prefer the term spiritual mother or spiritual father over spiritual director. Mm. I continue to use the word spiritual director because it's well known and and there's a strong tradition around it. But I think that posture of motherhood or fatherhood, the kind of committed, supporting, formative relationship that's there is more descriptive. And then the spiritual uh, descriptor helps to say that, you know, the focus is on the, uh, the relationship with God. But of course, that really encompasses the whole of life. Everything is right. is ultimately connected to our relationship with God. And right. then as you say, the uh, the work of the catechist is really uh, accompaniment for children. And I was particularly struck, I hadn't thought about that uh, specifically. I wasn't, uh, just hadn't put those two worlds together until I had, in one of the first um, spiritual direction courses that we taught. Celine Mitchell, who is uh, mm-hmm. a, a level three formator, and is yeah, been... we've had her on the podcast before. Oh, great! She's just a marvelous person, and she is. Uh, while we were teaching the class, I think after maybe at the first break, she came up to me and said, "This is what CGS is—a catechist is a spiritual director for children or a spiritual yes. companion for children." And then, as soon as she said that. Throughout the course, I kept, she was over in the corner of my eye and everything I said, I kept (laughs) mapping over into the CGS world and thinking, oh, wow, that connects. Oh, that connects. That connects. She's making more connections. I want to learn about all the connections. (laughs) Yeah, just a really, really exciting uh, connection between those worlds, I think. Would you share with us what some of those connections are that you notice? Yeah, I think that posture of a spiritual director uh, doesn't necessarily teach anything. Uh, Teaching is not a necessary part of spiritual direction. It can be a part. uh, Mentoring, instruction, guidance, teaching, it can be a part. It's not opposed to spiritual direction, but it's not a necessary part. So if if you start from that posture, how different that is than our kind of CCD teachers, if you will, right. whose right. primary focus is teaching. I'm going to come in and teach the children a bunch of things. And I think in, in CGS, the catechist, of course, is presenting works, presenting the mysteries, the scriptures, the liturgical uh, uh, gestures and, and parts to the children. But then the, the posture is so much giving the children a space in which they can work with the mysteries and then being ready to receive their experience of it and, and helping them to go deeper in it. And so mm-hmm. I love the, the pondering questions. Uh, who do you think the, the shepherd is? That the, or who do you think the sheep are that the shepherd would know them by name? And just asking those kinds of questions. It's much more the posture of the spiritual director to observe things to reinforce points that the the directee is already discovering, to go at the directee's pace. It's not about getting through materials so much as it is about listening to how the Holy Spirit is at work in the right. in the directee's heart. And and I think the same way with the catechist and the children in CGS. Right. Right. You have to completely let go of any agenda and let the Holy Spirit truly be the guide within that relationship. And and you're just kind of lucky to get to witness it. That's how it's always been with the children. And I can imagine that that's exactly what it is as as someone who's a companion as well. Yeah, I love that. It's worth saying again, we're we're lucky. We are we are so fortunate to be able to witness this process. The the spiritual director uh, works with the heart of an individual. There's a level of trust that has to be developed that we get a, a view, a window into the heart of how God is working in the heart of a person. And that's what I see in the atrium and the, the, the stories that I hear. I have to admit, I, I'm, I'm more in touch with the stories that I hear from Anita and Celine and others who have been so gracious to, to share that with me. But um, my, my experiences in the atrium are, and, and children are so transparent anyway, you can kind of... Uh, when they're not looking, you know, see what's going on in their hearts from observing them in some ways, but but then getting to see the the pictures that are drawn, the stories that are shared, the the lights that go on, 
the, the responses that they have, it is such a privilege to be able to see how God is working in the hearts of, of children. Right, right, and you, you that you've multiple times lifted up the that art of observation that is so key to what we do in the atrium, and it's also so key to accompaniment and spiritual direction. You very much are just kind of observing the person in front of you, and seeing um, what face of God that this person needs at this time, or to help them see the face of God that's right before them, um, and it takes like a a place of humility, a place of, I am not the teacher. I am here to just observe what is before me rather than come with an agenda. And that is really difficult. That is really difficult to do, to kind of um, make yourself very small before this person, whether they are three years old or 33 years old before me um, and God before me, making myself very small before them. Yeah, one of the things that we talk about with spiritual direction is the vulnerability of the spiritual director, yeah. which is not a matter of the spiritual director divulging his or her spiritual life, but it's a vulnerability of trust, of receptivity, of opening the heart to receive the directee. And that's what I'm, I'm hearing as you're describing the posture of the catechist, who is going to let the child lead to a certain extent and trust that yeah. where the child is going and uh, what what is happening in the child uh, it requires a lot of trust to open the heart and receive that, to be small enough, as you say, to uh, encounter that. There's a real humility that's involved, yeah. and uh, it's it, it does require a lot of, uh, oh, uh, well, it requires a lot of heart, I suppose, on the, on the catechist and, and some work to set aside our own agenda and to right. trust in in what we can't control ultimately right. that we can't we can't determine the path we we have to let the the holy spirit really be to guide the process right right um one of our founders Jana Gobi she speaks about how you have to have an examination of conscience before you encounter the children of really checking yourself for pride and anger of um I'm totally, I don't have the book in front of me, Listening to God with Children, to quote it exactly, but it's one of my favorite quotes, and she's saying something like, pride that um, the children are not responding the way we want them to, or maybe that's anger, I could be getting it backwards, and um, also that we believe that the children are somehow our own, so we have to check ourselves to not... Um, have those two sins of thinking that we have some kind of expectation or ownership of what is going to happen when we encounter God with the children. Um, And I hear that so much in what you're saying of what you do also in spiritual direction and accompaniment. It's very much of a lessening of yourself um, and not having any preconceived plan or expectation of what is going to happen between this person and God. Yeah, yeah, so beautiful. And uh, sometimes, uh, just to throw this in there, uh, accompaniment has been uh, kind of criticized as if there is uh, no direction at all. And, uh, you know, if the person wants to wander off a cliff, we let them. And, and of course, that's <laughs> not true. You know, there is a, there is a direction, there is a structure. And, and, and I think in spiritual direction, it's uh, analogous to, to CGS. There's a there's a particular place. There are, there's a particular structure in terms of the, the liturgical, scriptural foundations. We're, we're working within uh, some well-defined lines as our point of engagement, our point of encounter. But um, in, in spiritual direction, a, as in CGS, as far as I understand, the, um, you know, I mean, the directee or the, or the child in CGS uh, may come up with different kinds of things and right. may start to go in different directions. And we right. don't just sort of uh, shut things down or shame things or we, we allow a lot of space, but then we're, we're representing, we're, we're showing the face of God. We're showing the heart of God. We're using the words of God. We're, we're encountering God and, and the reinforcement. We really want our whole life to come into relationship with God. And sometimes that's the places in our hearts where we wander uh, astray a little here or there. Right. We want those places to come into relationship with God as well. Right, right. But I find with the children, and I, 
I'm assuming that this is probably the same of what you have encountered in both spiritual direction and accompaniment. I find that when you trust where the child goes after a presentation, it is it is something very authentic inside the child. Like whatever is going on in their life kind of um, boils up and that is revealed in where they go after a presentation. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Like if a child, maybe a child is really struggling with something in the home or with a relationship within a friendship or whatever, um, and that is what's heavy on their heart at that time. When I present something like the Good Shepherd, maybe um, their responses kind of reflect the the heaviness of their heart in that direction. Um, so it's kind of, it might not be what I was thinking what would happen when I present the Good Shepherd, but it's what needed to happen inside of that child, the the processing, the the healing, the um, the prayer that needed to happen with the, whatever's going on inside of that child at that time. And it's also the same thing that happens, I, I, I say this all the time about practical life that we do in the atrium. Sometimes a child just needs to pour for an hour and a half, and it's because they're processing whatever is happening in their life. I've seen it over and over and over again that a child sometimes is drawn towards something very simple because it's how they are responding to whatever's going on in their life. So there's a trust of, like you said, we're not letting them fall off the cliff, but (laughs) we are letting them guide um, based on whatever is happening in their life. They are drawn towards what need they have, what face of God they have, um, that they are needing at that moment. There's, there's a huge amount of trust involved in that. Mm, That's so beautiful. I love that. Yeah. And, and, uh, I'm just thinking too, uh, your, your insight and expertise that's grown over time as you've learned these kinds of things, like what is that child doing for an hour and a half over there pouring? Like what's going on with that? (laughs) And, and now you have, uh, you've gained some experience to be able to say, oh, they, they may be doing something simple because they're, they're processing something deep. There's something that needs to get worked over and, and uh, pondered, contemplated, digested internally. And, mm-hmm. uh, and that's the kind of experience that develops in spiritual direction too. We start to mm-hmm. recognize some behaviors that aren't obvious at first, some defenses that might come up or mm-hmm. some uh, points of resistance or some points of confusion, certain things that emerge. And and over time, as you as we get to know every heart is individual, there are patterns, however. <laughs> and so we can recognize some of those things that aren't obvious from the outside, but as we get a window to the inside, and that's such a privilege in spiritual right. direction, we can ask the question ultimately, what's going on in there? What are you thinking about? What's what are you processing? Right. And that's uh that's not only in bounds, that's uh that's very much the, the point to, to help with that. And I'm sure you you find ways to help the child uh, let you on the inside in CGS that way. Yeah. So in CGS, we have multiple different um, avenues in which a child can process. Like we have like practical life. And I'm not just talking about three-year-olds pouring. I mean, even 12-year-olds and even adults Mm. using pouring as a way of processing. But then there's also art. Like we have free art, which is just a blank piece of paper and a bunch of coloring pencils. Um, as a way for them to kind of process the scripture or process their life or process God or whatever is going on inside of them. I'm curious if you have different avenues like that in spiritual direction and accompaniment. Um, Sometimes I know for my own journey, speaking out loud to someone is very helpful, but then sometimes that's not the best way for me to process. So maybe it's silence. I don't know. Tell me your experience with the different (laughs) avenues that you can use with adults. Um, to help them process? Well, I, in my, my experience, I, I have found, uh, you know, at least for our time together, there's, uh, we tend to do the, the speaking, although I have, uh, I'm very comfortable with silence and I'm never rushing. And so sometimes there are longer periods of silence. I have used some things like uh, some guided meditation or, mm. or invited somebody to explore their, uh, their hearts in one way or another. Uh, also, um, less in, in my presence, but uh, invitations to pray with certain scriptures or with yeah. certain images or with certain memories and uh, inviting them to, to take those. Also things like uh, 
you know, I'm thinking of the pouring exercise, things like uh, walking or mm. uh, ways of praying, uh, forms of, of exercise that can help the body do something while the interior is also uh, digesting, processing some experience, certainly I- inviting people to take time in certain relationships or certain behaviors, uh, reading certain books. So different right. kinds of homework, you might say, which uh, is not a... a in every spiritual direction experience by any means, uh, for the most part, spiritual direction is receiving the person, helping them through through questions, listening, affirming responses, uh, silence to process whatever is coming up, really to go to the most interior places. That's always what we're aiming at, that kind right, of right. vulnerability. Um, but then um, on a semi-regular basis, offering some exercise to take home and and work with and then you know, seeing what happens with that. There's a kind of validation in spiritual direction, like I'm sure in CGS, that you sort of see what works. You know, if I right. give you this and it's uh, bring something out, great. And if it doesn't, fine. There's no, yeah. no pass fail going on. <laughs> right, right, right. I love what you said about the silence. Uh, it's almost an, an art to be comfortable with the silence. <laughs> a friend of mine calls it a pregnant silence, a silence where you can feel that there is something happening um, and it should not be rushed. But it it definitely takes growth <laughs> to be okay with the silence. Um, Sophia Cavaletti, our other founder for CGS, she speaks about how when a child has the quick response, you know that their response is on the surface. But when a child ponders before they respond you know that they have gotten deeper into their into their soul with that response and so you have to get really comfortable with those pregnant silences and not interrupt them in order to allow that that deeper deeper ponderment Mm, that's really beautiful so father boniface tell me about your program and tell me how you use catechesis as adult formation um, Catechese of Good Shepherd as adult formation in this program that you're using, that you're doing. Yeah, thanks. Um, so our, our Institute for Ministry Formation, you can find out more, imf.stvincentseminary.edu. You spell all that out. Uh, <laughs> we have a, we are just uh, going to launch in the fall a certificate in catechetics, which will have a CGS core to it. It will require uh, CGS level one formation. And then wow. the other courses in the curriculum will be the same kind of scriptural, liturgical, contemplative approach to catechesis that is uh, promoted, provided for through CGS. I think that's uh, just the right structure. So we want to prov- provide a, a certificate that you know, would form a DRE who has to be in charge of more than just the uh, catechesis for children. But we really want to give people practical experience in the atrium, exposure to it, and then the whole mindset uh, of CGS from the developmental models for the children uh, to also that that posture of scriptural, liturgical, contemplative catechesis to uh, to apply for adults as well. I love that. I love that. Uh, what we do, what we're talking about in this this deeper accompaniment and what we do with CGS and also what you do with adults. I love this idea of taking that foundation and applying it to all other ministries, um, kind of sharing that beautiful wealth with with all. And it doesn't have to look exactly like what we do in the atrium all the time because it's a very specific thing, what we do, but the the heart of it like what you're saying, the heart of it can be applied to all encounters. And I, I love that you're doing that. That's really neat. Yeah, it's a, it's been such a joy for me to be able to promote that. I, I had the chance to, I mentioned Anita Wright is the one that introduced me to CGS and uh, I had the chance to hire her. She's one of uh, the employees of our institute now. And so she's really dedicated to the uh, atria in Latrobe and uh, has developed all three uh, lo- levels plus the toddler atrium there. Um, my Another one of my employees is the, the catechist for the toddler atrium and uh, Bobby Abson. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then uh, re- working with, uh, I have another employee who's focused on parish outreach and formation and um, 
in, in that space, uh, gathering that, you know, there's something, there's a ministry to the parents as well. And um, I kind of planted that seed with Anita from some of my conversations with other priests who had CGS at their parishes, how important it is to be intentional about helping the parents to receive some formation. And so from early on, Anita had me give a day of recollection uh, in Advent and in Lent for the mothers when they dropped their children off at the atrium for two hours, I would take them in uh, and do a work with them and then kind of turn this into an adult version of uh, pondering the liturgy, the scriptures right. related to the liturgical season, etc. And I just watched. So I was learning that way. I was learning some of the presentations, but also uh, seeing how that would land in the heart of these mothers was very edifying for me. So we haven't fully developed that, but I, that's also a space I want to work with is, is how to provide more of that formation for the parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am, I am a big fan of applying what we do in the atrium to with parents. Um, it is very neat to see adults who we, most of us grew up with a very specific kind of religious formation that was much more the CCD type with the teacher. And so to help them get on a level where it's like, no, 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 there's no right answer. We're going to ponder this. We're just mm -hmm. going to sit with this and we're going to see what comes out. I do this a lot with sacrament parents and I really enjoy it because sacrament parents, you know, is a very specific group. And um, I love helping them get to a place of ponderment. So I'm excited to see what you're doing and I would love to see the fruits of that. That's really neat. Are there any other pieces of your work in your ministry that you would like to share with us before we finish? Uh, well, I was just going to uh, invite anybody to uh, it, who who finds our website. There's a there's a section on accompanying children, and uh, we also have some regular posts. Anita has been writing a kind of weekly CGS connection in which she's uh, looked through the the experience of different catechists, people who have encountered CGS, the uh, and then also different elements of uh, CGS. And she just has a really, she's a very contemplative person. And she uh, sort of gets the, you know, I think it's one thing to be a good catechist. It's another thing to know why you're a good catechist uh, mm. <laughs> or, or, or what it takes or what's going on. What are the, the underlying dynamics uh, at work? And, and I, she's really good at that if I, uh, and, and has been really a great help for me. So I, I think there's a nice resource there for anybody who's interested. Um, and then I, maybe I'll just say a last uh, point. We Well, no, maybe two points. We last year had a catechetics conference online, and mm -hmm. we focused on the Vatican Directory for uh, Catechesis, which uh, came out in 2020 with a, a tone towards evangelization. And we highlighted, we had about eight of the 16 presenters were CGS uh, folks, uh, formators and catechists, and tried to bring out the teaching of the Vatican Directory, but CGS uh, embodies that so beautifully. And mm. then, um, so we have those uh, recordings also on the website. And then for the Triduum, this is a, a, a potential, I might be uh, strung up for, for saying it and uh, <laughs> before we've fully committed to it, but um, we're working towards having, we've been having a Triduum retreat each year online, but we're thinking about doing it with a CGS tone this year mm. to look through the mysteries of Holy Week and have some presentations and points of prayer and just a way to enter into those three holy days, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday to enter into those uh, those days in the church's year with a CGS kind of uh, insight and contemplative approach. Mm. So uh, that'll be something to look for. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll bring that to uh, fulfillment and, and that'll be on the, the website as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I will get some of those links from you and we will put them in our show notes so that people can access and get more information for all of that. That would be great. Well, Father Boniface, thank you so much for joining me and speaking into this beautiful work that you are a part of. I really appreciate your support of catechesis, but also what you are doing in your work. Well, thank you, Carrie. It's really a joy. I'm, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, so supportive of catechesis of the Good Shepherd and delighted at this podcast and just so happy to support and, and promote uh, your work and the great work of CGS around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. I hope you enjoyed Father Boniface Hicks and all his beautiful wisdom. I have information in our show notes for all the different things that he spoke about for his website and for his work at St. Vincent Seminary. Also, if you are interested in learning more about or attending the virtual Tritium retreat that he spoke about that St. Vincent Seminary offers, there's a link in our website so that you can go there and learn more. So this year, they will be pondering the mystery of the Tritium through a Lectio style with, with recordings by different CGS catechists from around the country. And so I really strongly encourage you to go check this out and see if this is something that might enhance your spiritual journey through the tritium this season. I also am putting a link in our show notes to a past episode that we did that talked about catechesis of the Good Shepherd and spiritual direction, which, as Father Boniface Hicks pointed out, is very similar to accompaniment. So if you would like to ponder this connection more, go check out that episode. It's episode 37 called CGS and Spiritual Direction with Autumn Domain. I also want want to remind everybody that we have the audio version of The Religious Potential of the Child by Sophia Cavaletti, and it's read by Rebecca Reutsevich. We have this available through a Podbean premium channel. If you want to purchase access to the audio version of this really, really important book in our work, go check out our show notes for the steps on how to access that. Don't forget that we also, in our season three, you have the ability to submit questions that we will answer on our podcast. Either I personally will answer them or I will have our guests answer them. So if you have a question about catechesis of the Good Shepherd, maybe an issue in your atrium, a material, how to make something, whatever question you might have, please submit it um, to our podcast listening questions. We have a form that just takes about two minutes to fill out. I have a link in our show notes to access that form. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I would like to thank all the contributing members because you are making this podcast possible. If you would like to know more about the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member and support our work and have access to more things within our work, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.